on bits. Whatever you want. A nice shiny new beat on bits. Beat on bits a real winner. There's always room for beat on bits. Just gotta love beat on bits. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Beat on Bits podcast. This is a show where I talk about passions, projects, and playlists with some pretty cool people. My name is Brandon and I'm your host. And today we have joining us Ricky Rodriguez, all the way Hello, from everyone. Orlando, Florida. Say hi, Ricky. Hey there. Awesome. And he is the host of Rethought Park on YouTube. And today he's going to be joining us to talk about a few things like uh, his gig as a working actor in the Orlando area, some voiceovers work that he's done, his passion for entertainment and making people smile. Uh, Also his passion for voiceovers and the reason why he started up his YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's uh, let's just jump into it. Where would you like to start Uh, off in this list of passions? um, I guess I'll just start with introducing myself. Hello, as you mentioned, I'm Ricky Rodriguez. Uh, I'm the host of Rethought Park, the show where we analyze and break down, uh, analyze, break down and reimagine popular theme park attractions. And we're currently going on our first official month. We actually hit our double-digit subscriber, so Ooh, I'd say it's a pretty big mile, uh, uh, mark awesome. for some, yeah. uh, just a hobby. Yeah, for sure. So what's, yeah. uh, what's tell me a little bit about the show of Rethought Park. I didn't even know that's what it was about, but the name totally makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, um, the whole channel, my main content, uh, each, each week I take a popular theme park attraction. My most recent one uh, that I'm that I just uploaded was a Men in Black Alien Attack okay. at Universal Studios, and I just break down what went right with it, what, what I believe went wrong with it, and how what I would do to fix or reimagine the park. Oh, okay. or not the park, the ride attraction. Yeah, the, yeah, the ride. That's really cool. Yeah. And how many how many rides have you done in total so far? In total, I have done one, two, three. I have done four or five. I'm actually editing my next video currently that will be up next Saturday. Sweet. And I have, I have some other um, bonus episodes in as well. For instance, I did a vlog about uh, my experience uh, with Universal Security. Universal Security. Oh. I actually did a review of The Incredibles 2 that just came out as well. Oh, nice. Oh, I'll have to check that out. If, if you're interested in theme parks and all that good stuff, go, go check out that channel because that's what I'm going to do right after this. <laughs> all right. Thanks, cool. man. Yeah, for sure. No, it sounds really, really exciting. Uh, and actually, I'd just um, like to bring this up because we're still at the start of this. When I first got on the call with him, the first thing I noticed is like his voice was so like clean and HD. And I was thinking, man, this guy has to be into like radio or voiceover stuff or something. And then sure yes. enough, he's got all these voiceover gigs and stuff like that. So yes. you can <laughs> talk to us a little bit about those. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was a senior in high school, it actually all started with me trying to figure out what I was going to do when I went to college because I have a really bad habit of not getting hired for jobs. So I decided, you know what, I feel I feel like I'm pretty decent at um, the recording stuff because uh, I did for music. So like, why not try voiceover? See how that is. So after a solid three weeks to a month of research and training, uh, kind of just training myself, not really knowing what to do. I went and uh, auditioned, did a lot of non-paid gigs, and then I got my first paid gig in a video game, a small mobile app, and I played the main character Kim Jong Un. <laughs> and, yes, and that was the that first character I thought of when I heard your voice. That has to be work. a Kim Jong Un. <laughs> yes, uh, I played Kim. I. I didn't do, just for the record, I didn't do a racial Asian Kim Jong-un. Okay. Uh, the character was a bit more uh, Patrick Starr from Spongebob, so I, I talked like this for the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> that was me throughout the entire video game. Awesome. Uh, I haven't seen it up on the Google Play Store, so I don't know if that app is still available. Okay. But it was a couple years ago. Oh. Maybe we'll, we'll, I don't know. Someone will try to find it at some point. Someone will try to find it, probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it all started, that was like the first kind of official gig you got was this thing for the App Store yes. as, as Kim Jong-un. Yep. $48, <laughs> that was my pay. Oh, that's not too bad. How, how many <laughs> hours of work did you put into it overall, though? Um, overall, I only put in about an hour and a half of actual recording. 
That's and another good. hour and 15, no, I'm sorry, an hour and 30 minutes for actually editing and cleaning up the audio and 15 minutes for any small things that they needed to um, get fixed. So I would say a total of three hours and 15 minutes for about 48, for about $50. That's not too bad for like your first paid voice acting gig. Just out of high school in the yeah. summer, getting that getting that PayPal check was ecstatic. It was the one thing that got me like, okay, this is serious now. I gotta keep going. I gotta keep going. Oh yeah, no doubt. That must have been a huge motivator. What, what kind it of? Was. Uh, how did you find that gig in the first place? Um, I went on, a lot of people say that they go get agents. Me personally, I didn't. I went and did this website called a Casting Call Club, which is still up, which is something I use very regularly. Okay. And they have a bunch of non-paid, and they have a special pay, a page for professional paid gigs, and I decided just to press my luck, see if I was ready to dip my water into the paid gig. And sure enough, I got the gig. Awesome. So, so it, was, I, it was a mix of a stroke of luck yeah. and... Uh, just knowing where to look. Awesome. So you put together like a, a demo reel and stuff beforehand, or? Um, I actually did not do a demo reel. The way the website works is yeah. that you actually record auditions. So I oh. had to say a few lines from the actual video game in my character and just keep going. Oh, huh. oh, that's really cool. That might be something yeah, to check out if if anyone else out there is interested in voice acting. Yeah, they're um, Casting Call Club. I don't know if you're going to put a link in the description or somewhere. That's up to you. Yeah. But uh, it's the Casting Call Club is what I use mainly. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I know when I was looking into it at first, the whole um, process of starting a demo reel and stuff seemed really, I don't know, a little bit daunting and a lot of like labor intensive and stuff. But if you can just oh, it is. audition, that's that makes it so much more accessible, I think. Oh, yeah. And the whole acting business, it's like 90... It, I remember a quote from a voiceover artist that I well, looked up to. Uh, it's 90% auditioning and 10% getting the gig. Uh -huh. A lot of actors say that they actually audition for a living, and that's I'm just holding a bottle of water, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> for dramatic yeah. effects. For dramatic effect, just, uh, just and also to water. Earn yeah, those Dasani mostly, dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly auditioning in the um, acting world. Even recently, I, I still audition very regularly. Um, constantly re-auditioning, making sure they remember you. Yeah. And 10% is actually getting the gig. Nice. And it sounds like it's it's worked out a little bit better from you from there, too, and you've got a few more paying gigs after that. Yeah, um, I did get a few gigs. I actually recently uh, did a horror film that filmed in the area. And oh. I actually worked with like, the same company before. Yeah. Uh, we did a comedy about theme parks, funny enough, Yeah. Uh, starring Mitchell Musso. From uh, Disney Channel fame. Cool. Yeah, awesome. so that was. I started to book a couple of those, uh, more voiceover gigs. I find, kind of found my niche in audio dramas. Yeah. Where I played um, different. I played like a regular kid that got killed by a superhero. Oh. I played um, my one of my regular roles, uh, re reoccurring roles, I should say, was in an audio drama on the iTunes Store called um, Beyond School. Where mm -hmm. I played uh, Cap Captain Stowe, which is a reptilian alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Ricky was kind enough to give me a little sample before we started of the reptilian alien, and it sounded pretty pretty believable. If I close my eyes, I see reptilian alien in front of me. <laughs> you want me to do that voice for the uh, guests? Yeah, sure. For the audience? Yeah, just just do a yeah. couple words. Yeah, sure. You did good, Lackey. Found me vagrants on my space station. Nice. Did yeah, you hear the reptilian alien? I did. Probably, <laughs> those of you listening probably uh, recognize that voice. It's the same voice in SpongeBob SquarePants, where it's, I remember when they first invented chocolate. Yeah. I don't know why. It so almost sounds, get it. it sounds like that person's from, like, Boston or New Jersey or something and just smokes a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like that. Oh, man. I, it's the... I used to be a smoker. It's a terrible joke, but yeah. I do that every so often just so people understand like the type of voice that I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kills your vocal cords. Yeah. And I remember when I first booked the gig, I was excited, and after my first day of recording with them, I was like, oh, this is this is terrible. I need to find a way to fix it. Luckily, yeah. I went to um, uh, college for uh, musical theater to help my voice, mm -hmm. so it helped me get through that recording session, but... 
without training, I would have lost my voice immediately. Wow. So are there any tips that you can give people to kind of like maintain their voice and not kill it with random voices that they do all the time? Number one, a lot of water. Okay. And a borderline excessive amount of water. Not only does it like help hydrate, keeps you healthy, keeps the skin uh, glowing. It also helps uh, the vocal cords keep them healthy. Hmm. And it also helps um, a big problem that a lot of beginner voiceover uh, people have is kind of a clickiness in their recordings when they're recording. I don't know if you can hear it. It's like... Oh, like with their mouth sound. smacking sounds? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that smacking sound. Yeah. It actually um, recurs from... Um, salivation and drinking water helps. Also, eating a specific type of um, apple helps as well. I learned that really? trick from James Arnold Taylor, hmm. who is um, Star Wars clone, who plays Obi Wan in the Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Oh, cool! So, what what kind of apple is this? Is it a secret it, apple? I, it's a Granny Smith green apple, I believe. That's the name of it. Oh, that's uh, like a really sour one. The very really sour yeah, one. Yeah, 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 it helps um, bring out more salivation um, hmm. in the mouth, so it helps with the clickiness. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's I totally get what you mean with the clickiness because I notice it even in some of my own videos because I'm like drying up from talking and just like oh my yeah, God. after talking for so long you're just like oh my gosh yeah it's like the tongue version of a dry heave oh no <laughs> it yes. sounds disgusting <laughs> it does sound disgusting but like you know what you know what I mean yeah yeah I know what you mean okay right so that that's some. Uh, useful tips for any aspiring voiceover artist and just kind of a nice interesting peek into the voiceover world and I think your passion that kind of took you there in the first place had to do with uh, like you mentioned earlier entertainment and making people smile so yes. where did that kind of come from? Um, that actually stems it all started in um, elementary school when I was in third grade I was kind of thrust into the performing I really didn't want didn't want to be on stage but after my first um, performance, I saw all the parents being super happy. So I really enjoyed that. Hmm. So all throughout my life, I've really enjoyed making people smile, whether it be uh, playing music for them, like serenading them with a the ukulele yeah. or um, being a character on stage. I always uh, tell people that my favorite thing about acting is controlling how people feel, uh, hmm. saying one thing, making people smile, saying another thing, making people cry. But I like the happiness more. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I also I also like um, performing magic. I do it every so often just to kind of oh, really? make kids feel welcome, make them make them feel at home, make them feel at ease. Nice. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, doing that throughout my life, I enjoy seeing people smile. So I enjoy all forms of entertainment, which is one reason why I got so into theme parks. It's because there's a special. I think I believe it's a special form of entertainment. Yeah. that isn't as appreciated as it could be. Yeah. Especially the um the ride attractions, the shows where people go and they ride for a couple for two to three minutes and they get off and like, oh that was fun and then they forget about it. Well I'm the person who gets on this ride and wants to learn everything about it. Especially when I go to Disney or Universal, I'm like, what is the what world am I getting sucked into? Yeah. What's the backstory? What's the story of the whole ride? Yeah. Even on a regular roller coaster, probably like Rick Ride Rocket, there's something behind it. So I always get engulfed in the story. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with theme parks. Yeah, I, I think Disney did that really well because, um, yeah, I just went to Disney World for the first time ever like a couple weeks ago. I know some of the rides, ago. yeah, a couple weeks ago now. Uh, and it was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, went there for my yes. one-year anniversary with my wife. It was it was both the first time, so that was really fun. Mm -hmm. I noticed the mandatory that, complimenting Disney parks, of course. Yeah, 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 and it, it was it was really cool. Um, like some of the rides, they weren't necessarily like throwing you around or anything, uh, like physically stimulating. Even if it's just like a right. boat ride, though, they put so much. You can tell they put so much like thought and like and uh, engineering and just like a whole lots of imagination into the experience exactly. of riding this boat through wherever wherever you are and you really right. makes you feel something oh yeah and disney does this with not only just their attractions but with every little detail like i remember the feeling i got when i found out that there was a whole backstory to typhoon lagoon the whole water part hmm. and it made sense as well as blizzard beach as well right and pleasure island when i found out that there was a whole backstory to these things that connected in some way and it fascinated me just how much 
thought that Disney and by extension Universal just focus on the story and enveloping people in, in the attractions and getting people sucked into the world. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's one thing that I aspire to like achieve in everything that in everything that I do. Try every entertainment thing that I do, trying to get people engulfed into the story that I'm weaving. Yeah, yeah, that takes it like next level because anyone can tell a boring old story like I went to the grocery store and bought a celery stick today but like how did you feel when you bought that celery stick that's what I want right yeah even the way you tell it is actually it's way different for instance uh, I'm trying to think of a good example especially in a a ride because that's my specialty yeah Um, with a we'll just throw out um, we were talking about men in black alien attack yeah you could make it into a regular dark ride, kind of like the Haunted Mansion, where you see a bunch of aliens out and attacking you. Men in Black Agent is going out and attacking them and shooting back at them with their lasers. That's one way of telling the story. And I'm not saying that would be a bad way, but another way of telling the story is with putting you in the middle of the action with the laser gun in your hand, which is what they do. Making you the men in black agent, which is a completely different way of telling the story. Now you can affect the outcome. Yeah. You can control exactly which aliens you're focusing on. You, and each time you write it, it's different. Really? And it's amazing. Hmm. Uh, And I didn't, I haven't been to the universe studios there, so I don't know what that one, but that sounds really cool. How you can affect the, yeah, the whole experience yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with that one, depending on how well you do, you actually get three different endings. Oh. Uh, you, yeah. Uh, and very recently, I I found out what the top ending is when you reach the highest score, get the Galaxy Defenders ending, where you, they actually provide you, not really provide you, but one of the aliens starts trimming your MIB suits Oh. in front of you and I never realized that that was a thing and it huh. blew my mind wow that's really cool the first thing I thought of when you mentioned like the being plunged in the action of kind of a story of the ride was the Spider-Man ride if you've done yes. that one yeah because that one I, I went to um, Universal Studios in in Tokyo or no not Tokyo it's in Osaka and um, mm-hmm. that one was really cool like it was weird hearing all the voices in Japanese and stuff but like <laughs> Just you still know what's going on because you're just like a reporter and then you're being like saved from everything that's happening around you and stuff. Right. It's, it's in, really cool. It, let, let me fill you in in the English version. Okay. The, um, if I haven't written that ride, I've never left the United States, so I don't know if it's exactly the same or just similar. I'm but in the is. Orlando Universal version of the Spider Man ride, it's you're employed as a reporter in the Daily Bugle. Yeah. And all these villains are stealing the Statue of Liberty. You need to go and report that, but you get mixed into everything, and Spider-Man has to go and save you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, it's a very basic thing, but again, think, I'm telling you this story. You can imagine, oh, that's one thing, but riding it, actually seeing the face of the Statue of Liberty in front of you yeah, and having Doc Ock and Spider-Man going at it right in front of your face, it's such a thrilling experience yeah. that it's something that kind of that i think stays with me and i i'm hoping it stays with other people yeah for sure like i I can even see like scenes of the ride so vividly even though i haven't been to that one for four or five years now yeah so right it's, it was it was really memorable it was really well done oh yeah and it's actually still one of my favorite attractions in the whole in the whole park yeah, I was I was kind of excited about um, before I made my way to Disney World. I was like, oh, they they acquired Marvel not too long ago. I wonder if there's going to be any like Marvel rides. And I looked into it and then discovered the whole legality stuff of how like they'll probably yes. never get the Marvel rides. So that was a bit of a Legalities. letdown. But... <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's universe. Universal made a good move with not allowing the park, the Disney parks, to use the Marvel name. Yeah, I do admire that. Yeah, that's some good However, business. However, it does prevent like, well, what would Disney do if they didn't have any restrictions? Yeah, because I don't know. I haven't. Um, I don't know. What, like I said, I don't know what the Universal Studios is like in Orlando, but I know like with the Disney World, they have like the different lands that are totally like the whole environment's themed from for the movie or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. So I'd be really curious to see like a Marvel themed one. 
That'd be really yeah, cool. they actually um, are. Re- they actually um, switched out in Hollywood, um, Disney and Hollywood, the yeah. Hollywood Tower of Terror. Yeah, they changed that to Guardians of the Galaxy already, and Disney World in Florida is actually getting their own Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster, I believe. Oh, Epcot. really? Huh. So, I'll get back to you once I ride that ride and tell you how the Guardians of the Galaxy goes. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I I went on the the Hollywood Tower of Terror, and that was like super cool. Cause I I was like. No, I was just on there. That can't be. But, yeah. yeah. Well, um, really well cool. they only changed it in one park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, it's, a bit diff- it's a bit different. Just the Tower of Terrors from Orlando and uh, Hollywood, for instance. In the Hollywood version, once you get in your car, they pull you backwards. Oh. And then you start going up and down. Yeah, but in yeah, Orlando, yeah. You go forward. once you get in your car, they lift you up, show you a scene, lift you up. And then you start moving forward yeah. in this elevator into the twilight zone and then you get to the drop tower yeah. then you go backwards and turn around. it's like a whole dark ride in there yeah so both call both um rides even though they're the same ride call for different experiences as well totally so you've done both like hollywood and orlando then um i wouldn't say that much <laughs> i um. have n- um i have not gone on the California. I've never been to Cal- the California Disney. I've okay. never been to California myself. Oh, but I am very passionate about my um, theme parks, so I do a lot of research. Uh, I try I watch as much, try and get as good of an experience as I could. Yeah. Uh, as until Disney gets their own version of it. That makes sense. Yeah, cool. I know a lot of people are going to be like, "Oh, you're not a true Disney fan. Why would you just go and stick with?" finding it on well that's it's all i could do at the moment just yeah if anyone's judging your disney fandom by how much money you have to like throw around i don't think that's fair <laughs> it's not fair but yeah. that's how a lot of fandoms are so i guess fair enough there are some people who spend obscene amounts of money on the most random fan items so there's that very true okay golden fidget spinners yeah <laughs> no thanks <laughs> so <laughs> Let's uh let's talk about you starting up your YouTube channel and kind of the story behind that because you had a some really really deep topics there and uh, I think it'll be really interesting to share that experience with everybody. Yeah. So the whole backstory of how I decided to start my um, YouTube channel started a while ago when I had a full time job that wasn't acting. Uh, I did direct marketing sales. I would go to Sam's Club and try and sell like um, water-based products. I'd try and sell flat irons. And I never hated a, a job more than I hated that one. It was the people were terrible. I hated the job I was doing. And on top of that, I was going through a rough patch um, in my family. We were going through kind of tension and we had a death in the family so everything was just piling up and um i get a little bit emotional when i say it so forgive me if i choke up but um yeah everything was just piling on i just went to the funeral work was still trying to get me to work on those funeral days so there was one day i just got burnt out so i decided you know what today i'm just going to take a me day an, an unplanned me day just cut off everything not go to work uh, don't go hang out with my friends and family like I was going to do that day. Just spend the day for myself, which is kind of a jerk move on my part, I admit, but it was very much needed. So I decided to spend my day at Universal Studios because I had a free ticket to go on both parts. And I was I went there, I had a lot of fun, and I decided to go on the new Fast and Furious ride. And when I went on it and I got off, I kept having these emotions and I felt like it wasn't, it was a mix of how I felt about that ride and how I felt about everything that I just kind of not, I didn't go overboard and get mad, but I got really irritated and I just needed to vent out how I felt about it. So I decided, you know what, now's the time. I put up um, my microphone recording equipment and recorded my, what I thought went wrong with Fast and Furious and that was my first video. And I shared everything that I thought went wrong about it and what they could have done to make it 10 times better. Hmm. And I never thought anything of it, but then I started getting a bit more views. Uh, I thought, you know what, let me try and post a second one. So I did one on a a ride that I liked a bit more, but I still could 
could have used some help. And that one got even more views. And I was like, you know what? Let me let me continue. There's there's an audience for this. Yeah. Let me see if I can uh, make their day a little bit better with what I can do. Awesome. So that's how um, the reason why I started, and I don't think I'm going to stop anytime soon. Yeah, no, that's great. It's like a, a real like healthy redirection of kind of your energy and emotion into making something right. that other people can find like entertainment and and help in. That's really cool. Yeah, but, and it's uh, one of those things where every so often I'd get a bit uh, annoyed. Maybe something goes wrong in the show that I'm in. Or just something family-wise or friend-wise. So I just kind of like take some time. I sit down and I go through my phone and do some editing. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, here's some ideas for a um, for a script. So I start writing the script. Or here's some uh, good ideas for the video. So, and it's just kind of a good way to just kind of escape and be my own. Just kind of be in my own little bubble. Yeah. And focus on something. So tell me about kind of how the 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 format of your channel is set up. Do you write a script about everything you're going to say and kind of like the solid points of the ride and everything or yeah uh so my main content i do write uh, a script and i try and stick to that script as much as possible but every so often i write typos so it takes me like five takes to get over it oh. <laughs> uh, but it essentially starts with i announce the uh the ride for instance um i'm actually editing spoiler alerts if you're a fan <laughs> um i'm actually currently uh, working on an episode about splash mountain Nice. Uh, which is my fir- my first Disney attraction. On oh, the channel. You, but, but, so sorry. I'm, I'm just gonna cut you off for one second because of Splash Mountain. Yeah. Do you, are you familiar with Clickhole, the website that's uh, like kind of parody news? No, I am not. It's it's like it's kind of like the Onion, but for I don't know more of like specific stuff. So just like literally right. fake sensational news about whatever. And there's one article in Clickhole specifically about Splash Mountain, and I don't know what someone has to be on to think of the concept for writing this article, but they did a whole article about writing Splash Mountain and uh, like the animatronic fox kept talking directly at the person riding the ride that he was going to marry their dad. That is creepy. <laughs> it's like, that sounds he goes on a big creepy. long thing. And luckily you're... my video is not about that. Yeah, sorry. I just, it just reminded <laughs> no. me of that and I had oh, to mention man, it. <laughs> I love those weird creepy things like, uh, I've heard instances where someone was riding again Splash Mountain, yeah. and they were kind of messing with everything. So they had two cast members dress as the animatronics, walk into the area, pull them out of the log, and pull them away. Just oh so no way! Distract. I highly doubt that that's true. Yeah. But I remember reading about it when I was younger and thinking, "What kind of story is this?" Yeah. Oh, that, that's hilarious, though. <laughs> so sorry to cut you yeah. off. Please, please continue. No, that's okay. So, uh, for instance, with Splash Mountain, I start with uh, what I thought about the um, the ride and personally, I, I think it's almost a flawless ride, except for the fact that they take inspiration from a very, very controversial film, uh, mm-hmm. Song of the South, which is about sla- um, a slave man, and all that stuff. So I find the main problems with it, with an attraction, and I kind of spin it around to think, what would we, what would I personally do to fix it? Hmm. And what I decided to do was to change the branding from basing the characters off the Sound of the South to a more friendly, a family-friendly uh, franchise that hasn't been utilized. So I thought, why not make Splash Mountain about the recent film Moana? Oh. So I try and think of what we would utilize that's already existing in that ride and add it into and add Moana into it, or add their own, or add their own elements and just kind of. I try and paint the picture of what the ride would be. Yeah. So I use I usually end it with explain with kind of doing a small narrative of what you would experience in this ride. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, and they don't have anything Moana themed yet, right? Not that I'm they they do use Moana the character in a few of the shows, I believe. Right, right. But no but rides. There isn't an actual attraction as far as I know. That's in the works. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. Know. Yeah, because I, I did see that they're about to open up, like, Toy Story Land at the end of June. I yeah, think. in California. and In California, they already have a, Dis- a Toy Story Land, but in, in Disney World, they are opening one as well. Okay, yeah. And they actually also released Pixar Pier, so I don't know what they're... I don't know what Disney's going to do with Moana. But if Disney, if you're watching, Splash Mountain needs a new character. And, and Disney, if you're watching, 
Thanks. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, whatever you want to do, man. <laughs> uh, Disney's watching. We've hit the big time. Yeah. Wow. If, if Disney's watching, then this blew up a lot faster than I realized. And that's exciting. Honestly. Yeah. Because right now, my channel's not too big. And this is... Um, hey, neither is mine. Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see where it goes. You never know what someone really wants to see and then share it with everybody. And then stuff just blows up. Cause yeah, who knows? Maybe there's an Imagineer that's a very big fan of small YouTube channels. Maybe. That'd be cool. That would actually be such a good story if someone came across your content like that and was like, this guy has some amazing ideas and then just reaches out to you and then you become an Imagineer that, yourself. I always, um, I every time I post uh, a video, I always have this thought like, what if Disney or Universal actually sees this and thinks, oh, these are some good ideas and they imp and I influence something. Yeah. And I've always thought that I don't need to be credited if I know that I did an impact. I made an impact. For instance, I know there was, I posted an idea of a short film and someone from India, a college student in India, uh, saw that and decided, hey, I can use this for a uh, short film project I'm doing. Hmm. Actually messaged me and goes, hey, this idea is good. Is it okay if I use it? I'm like, yeah, sure. You don't need to credit me as long as I know. So yeah. I get my satisfaction. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And it's not like you're... If, if, I, if, I guess it's a different story if you're relying on something for like your livelihood. But if you're just sharing what you love, then it's... And if someone wants to like push it even farther, then it's just even like more validation for yourself that way, right? Yeah. It's, it's more satis that satisfaction in knowing that I've influenced something. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, a more recent um, story of that is... I. For those of you who don't know, I work at an animal show uh, close by. I'm not going to say where, just so that I have some sort of... So you don't stalk him. <laughs> but um, I play a couple characters, and there's a part that we've always left kind of open in the air. I could improv a couple things. And I said a line that was so funny that they decided to make it a permanent line. Oh, no actually way. Actually added into the script yeah. and mandatory for each actor to say that line at that specific <laughs> moment. That's and brilliant. when I I went to the green room, I saw that posted on the wall, new line, this, this, this. I freaked out for a week, just smiling every time I walked on stage saying, this is my line. I got to yeah, yeah, yeah. own it. That's awesome. Are, are you allowed to <laughs> say what that line is or is that non-disclosure? Um... I don't believe it's non-disclosure. I mean, there's video of it, so oh. I, I'll say the line. And if you figure, if anyone figures out like where that line's from, then that's good on you. But I won't say where it's from. Okay. The line is: "These animals, they wouldn't know talent if it hit them on the head." Okay, that's that's pretty it, solid. It, yeah, it, and the line itself isn't funny, except as I say that a bird lets go of a sandbag, and that hits me on the head right after I say it. <laughs> Perfect timing. It is perfect timing. So you um, weren't exaggerating at all earlier when you said that you have to dodge bird crap a lot of the time. <laughs> yes, I do have. To. There have been several instances where I'm holding a bird in my left hand and just excrement on my pants. Oh, and great. I don't notice it until after I get off stage. So the audience gets a good laugh at that. Oh, <laughs> as long as it doesn't get on them, I'm sure they'll still find it entertaining. Yes, absolutely. And in every animal show, nothing is funnier to the audience than animals pooping. Yeah. That is the show-stopping joke. It, it's, it's funny you say that because, like, that's, that's, like, something no one ever really thinks of when you go on, like, a safari or, like, a national park to see some animals. Is like, I'm going to go to the park and see if I can find a buffalo pooping. But you yeah, go, and no then sure enough, they no do. <laughs> No one above the age of eight actively goes to find animals going to the bathroom, but everyone finds it hilarious when it happens unexpected. Yeah, there was, there's a national park uh, about a 45 minute drive from my house here in Edmonton, Canada, and you can find like uh, like bison and elk and stuff there occasionally, and there was this one like big dude on the side of the road, and there's seven cars stopped like taking pictures while he's just like, just letting it all out. <laughs> Just doesn't care that anyone's well, there. We're stop. We're like, ah, oh, let's just keep driving. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not watch that. Yeah. Um, and 
I, I've yet to understand exactly why. I guess it's kind of just like the childhood and everyone just kind of coming out at that moment, especially for guys, especially for guys. <laughs> I, every, t- every time I'm in the show and a bird poops, I always hear a bunch of kids laughing, uh, a bunch of little girls going, ew, and one guy, one bigger guy going, <laughs> <laughs> just the one guy eh? <laughs> that's the one guy and uh, i'm like hey it's that guy it's, that guy's in the audience yep is, is he like your biggest fan and just comes to every single show and just he's waiting for the bird poop <laughs> um he's not thankfully but those types of people actually exist in the show oh. um the people that have like oh this one bird trainer is my favorite bird trainer so i'm gonna go every time they're going oh. it gets a little creepy but still like we still appreciate it you know yeah and i think in any line of work where you kind of put yourself out in the public you have to appreciate any any way that someone shows that they're into what you're doing even if oh, it's yeah, kind absolutely. of weird <laughs> and yeah, and my biggest achievement is i've actually with that show i've actually had a couple kids come up and ask for my autograph oh no way and it just took my heart and wrenched it i'm like wow, I'm actually making an impact in these kids' lives. I will gl- gladly sign my full name. Here's my address, everything. Just take it. Just take it. <laughs> You're just like tears of joy streaming onto the page. You're like, of course, I'll yeah. sign <laughs> I'll gladly. That's so, hilarious. Yeah, um, that show is actually one of my favorite gigs that I've ever done. Yeah, um, aside like from it. the bird poop. Yeah. So did you know anything about kind of animal handling before you got there? You just learned it all on the job? Not at all, actually. And uh, the whole audition situation was actually very interesting. The way that that um, um, zoo works is that when the performers audition, they do the general audition. They audition for like other shows as well. And they email you or call you for a callback. I got the call saying, hey, we have an animal show. We need a performer. Uh, you, we want you to come in for a callback. So, okay. I arrive at the theater before uh, park opens. They, I sing a couple of the songs. I perform some of the pieces, do some of the characters. And then I'm on stage. One of the trainers brings a parrot huh. onto the stage. I'm like, okay, this is this animal. Uh, hello. And then they go, stand right here, hold your left arm like this. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And then out of nowhere, I see them toss the bird towards me oh. and half of my mind thinks oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness i'm not prepared i'm not prepared yeah 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 but it, it lands on my arm and after the initial shock of claws hitting your arm yeah i just kind of get this wave of i'm holding a bird i've never i've never held a bird before huh. so um i found i found out that they do that to see one if we're scared of birds two if the birds like us back and three if we're actually this not passionate passion is not the word but we're into this like you're, stuff you're serious about it and then yeah and after you uh you get the job then they teach you they teach you how to hold the animals properly how to do some of their behaviors how to feed them properly how much to feed them uh when to give them treats when yeah. to just ignore something that they do and they just kind of teach you the whole thing so I would say I have mastered the basics of animal training and animal handle. That's really impressive, though. I can just imagine like how many epic failures there would have been when someone throws a bird at them to test them during the audition process. Yes. We actually have a train, uh, not a trainer, a tech. Um, she mainly works lights who um, is actually really terrified of birds. Oh, no. And no one told her that during one of our shows, we actually had these tiny little birds called conyards flying from the stage to the back of the audience at her face. Keep in mind, there are 12 of these coming straight at her. No one told her. And it was the funniest scream I've ever heard. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be hilarious. It was very, it was pretty funny. We all apologize in tears laughing because of how funny it was. And gladly she forgave us and she still works there. So good on her. Happy ending. Yeah. I think one thing I just want to touch back on really quick before we jump into your your playlist because we're getting close to the the end of the, my regular time is uh, already yeah already it just flew by hey goodness yeah I usually like to do about like 
like 40 to 50 minutes and then my mix at the end of the show is usually around 10 to 15 or so Keep all it right makes sense. yeah so um one thing that we didn't explicitly talk about but that was kind of an undertone to the whole story of you starting a youtube channel is you felt kind of selfish taking a day to yourself but i think that that's kind of a mindset that some people need to get past and just do it because ultimately if you can't like help yourself and know what you're feeling, you're not going to be able to show your true self to other people and help anybody else. Right. So I think... Right. That's, it's a lesson that it was a struggle for me to learn because there was part... And I found out that there needs to be a balance of it. Yeah. Because when I was growing up, I was always, I can do whatever I want in life. I'm going to go focus on being artsy. I'm going to go focus on being whatever I want to do and just focus on myself. But then after a while, I realized there's more than just myself. Just yeah. focusing on what I love to do. I need to work. I need to save to do what I need to do. So that's when I went to that uh, time of just focusing on that sales job. I actually had uh, another telemarketing job before that. So just constantly just trying to build up just grinding um, it out. work. And I was just getting burnt out. And there yeah. was a whole week or so of just everything happening everything kind of, it felt like I was crumbling to the ground. So that's when I realized, oh, it's important, yes, that I need to work, but it's also important that I need to find what I love, find a path, find a hobby. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be paid. It doesn't have to be um, full-time. It just be something that makes you smile. Yeah. Whatever it is. And a lot of people, it's uh, doing gardening. And that's awesome. Go garden every so often. Make, keep your yard clean. If it makes you happy, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, me personally, it's uh, this YouTube channel. It's researching for theme parks. Absolutely, it's working on voiceovers. Every so, every chance I have, I am either uh, researching something about theme parks just because I'm interested, or I'm looking at voiceover gigs, trying to find ooh, this will be awesome to um, audition for, or I'm sleeping. But that's <laughs> besides the point. <laughs> I think sleeping is an important passion to have and dedicate time I mean, to. I mean, that as well. is true. Sleep is very important. Don't not sleep. Yeah. So with that, let's move on to the playlist. And you have three songs that you've uh, talked about with me before we started. So maybe you can, I'll just list them off and then you can talk about each one and kind of what right. you like about it and, and what it means to you. So your three songs that you've chosen are Remember Me from the movie Coco, uh, a song yes. called The Club by In the Heights uh, musical, and the last one is The Lesson by Victor Wooten. So what can you tell us about these songs and uh, what you like about them? Yeah, well, um, I'm just going to start chronologically in what sure. I felt like impacted my life. It starts with The Lesson by Victor Wooten. It is a piece of music. It's not technically considered a song, which I've learned very, very vigorously in high school. Okay. Um, the difference. But... This piece of music is actually a bass solo, which all throughout middle school and high school I played electric bass. And it was, it's a very meditative piece of music. It's something that I listen to, I just put on my headphones. If I'm having a pretty stressful moment or if I just want to kind of be in myself, be in my own uh, bubble, I would put that piece of music on, just kind of put it on replay, uh, just kind of take a nap to it or just kind of be in my thoughts. And it really has helped me get through like my whole high school career, that one piece of music. And I loved it so much that I actually started started learning it on bass. I haven't finished learning it. It's very complicated, as you yeah. can hear, as you would hear. Yeah. But it's a very, very fun piece, and I, lo I love listening to it. Hmm. That's awesome. And, I'm excited uh, to hear that. Yeah. Um, and the second piece that actually impacted my life was um, from the musical In the Heights. And if you don't know, the person who created In the Heights, Lynn manuel Miranda, also created Hamilton and made the music for Moana. So he is a very big impact um, in just the entertainment department yeah. of the world. But um, his one of his first musicals was In the Heights. Me being Hispanic, I actually connected with this whole musical about this Hispanic community, this poor Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. And the club which is one of the uh, longer pieces in there. I don't know if you're going to cut that down just to uh, um, be able to well, fit in there. Yeah, in the mix, we'll see how it goes. But the interview, I'm not yeah. cutting anything. It's just straight shot. Right, right. So um, this is where in the 
in the musical, the main character, Usnavi, decides to take time off from his store and go clubbing with um, his crush, Vanessa. And this whole, this is where all of my Hispanicness kind of comes out, for one. And two, this whole musical actually helped me through high school as well, uh, being bullied. I went to a um, very prestigious art school. And I don't, I don't want to toot my own horn. I don't want to be that type of person. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I went to this high school, and each major, each department had their own cliques. And the department, and the drama department, despised the band department, which I was a part of. But I also wanted to join drama, just kind of see what, uh, see what it was like. Yeah. And every every time I would audition or get cast, I would, was met with bullying. I was met with death threats. I was met with so many things, and I felt like do should I even be here? Should I just be in this area? And I found in the Heights around that time, I went and saw a high school production of it uh, down the road. And I thought, yes, this is me. This whole musical is what I aspire to be. Not just do that musical, but just to make people happy, just to make people feel accepted. Mm. Um, So that was another, that specific piece of my favorite piece in the musical, but that whole musical really helped me throughout my life Wow! and yes uh, and my most recent pick uh, obviously is Remember Me from Coco and the movie Coco uh, aside from being a um, Hispanic movie I'm Hispanic whatever yeah. um, this movie hit so close to home having recently um, gone through a loss in the family having knowing having a family member that is actually uh, very ill as well right now Mm -hmm. um this whole movie was actually hitting so close to home it was one of the one of the four movies that actually made me cry in my lifetime yeah um and specifically the song remember me was a song that i implanted onto these family members that have passed away or that i know has passed away Mm -hmm. in saying and kind of helped me shape my views on death where I don't think we should m- very much mourn the death as so much we should uh, celebrate their life and yeah. to just remember the good that they've done. Yeah. And that song just kind of fills me up with so many emotions when I hear it every time. Yeah. Oh, it was such a great movie. Yeah. It is an amazing movie. Yeah. It really sounds like kind of the... Um, I guess the theme behind the, the, the songs you've chosen today are all about kind of what helps you get through something and speaks to your emotion and relates to your experience too, which is really nice, really deep. I'll try to honor those in my right. DJ set, which is a very challenging thing to do, <laughs> but I'll do my best and uh, choose three of my own songs that kind of go along with the same theme uh, as well as I can, but it's going to be a challenge. Those are some very very emotional and very detailed explanation so thank you for sharing well, what's life us. without a candle a challenge goodness a candle <laughs> what's life without a candle i can't live without candles <laughs> no <laughs> yeah that was perfect okay cool so that was uh another episode of the beyond bits podcast with ricky rodriguez <laughs> join us to talk about his passions projects and playlists which is really fun and exciting today hope you enjoyed it glad to be watching. here yeah so until next time, uh, where can they find you on social media and everywhere else they can engage you with can you? You can find me on YouTube at Rethought Park, R-E-T-H-O-U-G-H-T Park. Mm-hmm. And you can also find me on Instagram as well. Uh, same thing, Rethought Park. Awesome. So check him out there if you want to see more from him. But for now, we'll say bye to him. Bye, Ricky. Bye. Right on. Yeah. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time.